guys to close your eyes for just a second and think about all the contents in your house. I want you to pull them all out and put them in front of your house. Take out your closets, take out the stuff that's underneath the kitchen sink and that bathroom sink and put it all out in front. Now open your eyes. Does it look something like this? <laughs> maybe it looks better. I don't know. Maybe it looks worse. But this is our stuff, right? This is our middle class stuff. And we buy it because it gives us comfort and joy in the moment. But I'm not completely sure about the comfort, as you'll see in a second. And the joy eventually starts to look like this. We forget about it, and it gets discarded to the garage or whatever place we have in the back. And the problem is not so much that we discard things. The problem is that there's about to be a whole lot more of us. There's going to be 9.5 to 10 billion of us by 2050, and everyone's going to want their stuff. As a whole, in the middle class, we currently spend $21 trillion a year. It's a, such a big number, you can't even get your head around it. $21 trillion a year on spending. By 2030, that number is going to jump to $51 trillion a year. And the reason why is because we're going to have about 1.8 billion new people entering the middle class. And the problem is not so much just about the sheer volume of stuff. That's a whole other talk. The problem is we don't really know what's in it. We are some 50 million man-made chemicals in the world, some 60 to 80,000 of which are used every day in commerce. And we regulate in this country 1% of them. We understand the hazards of 1% of them. And when we live in dense areas like cities, all of a sudden the impacts, the impacts of that becomes a lot greater. In 2005, the Environmental Working Group did some tests on newborn babies. They tested the umbilical cord blood, and they found 287 different chemicals in these newborns. And they used to believe that the placenta filtered those things out, but now they know that that's actually not happening. And what they found were cancer-causing chemicals and mutagens, which changes your genes, and reproductive toxins, and things that were going to cause abnormal birth defects and ultimately developmental problems. And where were these chemicals coming from? They're coming from our stuff. They're coming from our consumer goods. They're coming from our pesticides. They're coming from the waste that happens when we burn our stuff, our garbage. So it's not really surprising that we're spending in this country alone, again, on one segment of the population, kids, $76 billion a year. And this is a 2008 number, so frankly, the number is probably even higher. $76 billion a year to take care of our toxified kids. And the biggest number you're going to see in there is actually lead poisoning. And that comes from the fact that houses built before 1978 were made with lead paint, right? We outlawed lead paint but the dust is still happening. And the dust is coming in and coating our floors and it's coating our toys and the toys are going in the mouth. And my own personal story actually also stems from paint. In um, 2001, I bought my first house and I love paint color, so it's really painful to talk about paint in this way. And I felt like I was gonna go ahead and just make my house really beautiful with different color paint. And I'm painting and painting one night and it's cold so the windows and the doors are closed and I get this massive headache. And I keep painting because you know you can work through a headache and then I get dizzy. And at this point I'm like, ah, I better go outside. And I take this deep breath and I instantly felt better. And I know you're thinking, well, of course you felt better, right? Because now all of a sudden you're breathing fresh air. But the fact that you all know that is an indication that we all realize that we live with toxic chemicals every day, but we just don't know what to do about it. We think we have to choose between things that are beautiful and things that are safe, but that's a false choice. So the next day I'm at work and I'm telling my paint story to a colleague of mine and he said, oh, it's not just your paint, it's what's in your couch, it's what's in your clothing, it's, it's in your carpets, it's everywhere, but I have two great books for you. And he handed me these two books that literally changed my life. Cradle to Cradle by William McDonough and Michael Brungart. And that book said, we don't have a population problem. We don't have a stuff problem. We have a design problem. And Biomimicry by Janine Benyus said, guess what? Nature has solved most of the design problems that we have today. We just need to look and learn and pay attention to what nature does. We can 
we can achieve a sustainable world. So soon thereafter, I left HP and I went to work for both these organizations as executive director. And nature is amazing. It is abundant and it produces vibrant, beautiful things. But nature does it in a very smart way. It uses five polymer classes to make everything that you see out in the world. Five. We use 350. And when we're done with our stuff, we pile it into big cold, you know, big piles, and we let those decompose into our groundwater and into the air and into the soil. When nature wants to make something beautiful, it doesn't use any cadmium or lead or pigments or dyes to make that beautiful beetle. We, on the other hand, we use 750,000 metric tons, again, an enormous number you can't possibly get your head around, every year to make pigment that we then flush into the water. The reason that nature can get away with making only five, using five polymers to do everything is because it does everything through structure and through assembly. So the beetle, the beautiful rainbow scarab beetle, is made of chitin. That shell is cross-hatched in chitin to achieve strength. And it's got little nano bumps of chitin to achieve waterproofing. And it's got these thin, transparent layers of crystals almost that refract light. And that's what makes it look pink and green. On the other hand, this potato chip bag, that's got seven materials in it. It's got one for waterproofing. It's got another one to keep oxygen out. It's got another one to deal with the oils, another one to color it green. Adhesives makes it hard to recycle. So let's talk about like practical example. Let's talk about what's on your pants. I, um, I hate ironing. I've always hated ironing. And so when I learned about wrinkle-free clothing, I was pretty excited until I found out why it's wrinkle-free. And that's because it uses formaldehyde. And for those of you who don't know, formaldehyde's been linked to cancer, specifically leukemia. It is a endocrine disruptor, which means it's gonna mess with your hormones. It is a skin sensitizer. It is also a respiratory sensitizer, which means the more you're exposed to it, the worse it gets. And again, we use a million metric tons of this a year, which is particularly bad if you work in a factory that makes this stuff. So we approached Berkeley Center for Green Chemistry and Marty Mulvihill, that's the superhero green chemist you see over there. He and his partner, Dr. Meg Schwarzman, run a class called Greener Solutions. And so together we went to a major textile manufacturer and we said, can we help you solve this problem? And they were very excited. They said yes. So let me first tell you how a wrinkle forms. In case you don't know, this is your little technical lesson for the day. So pretend these are your fibers in your pants. They are cross-linked together by hydrogen bonds. But those are weak bonds. And when they're exposed to water or to heat, those bonds release and they break. And all of a sudden, your fibers are moving around. And then when they land and dry, that's a wrinkle. What formaldehyde is doing is it's acting like a glue. And it's just keeping those bonds in place. And that function, again, is cross-linking. And so what we're trying to do now is figure out how do we achieve cross-linking with benign materials. The problem is, is that most people don't know what to do with this question, right? This is the biologized question, how does nature cross-link? But if you're not a biologist, you're not going to know how to go to the literature and look up this question. So we created a free database. It's called Ask Nature, and it's online. And you can type in your question, how does nature filter? How does nature create color? How does, in this case, nature cross-link with weak, not with weak bonds, but in this case, with strong bonds? And we got some amazing answers. So the sea mussel actually has a life-friendly protein adhesive that's activated just by the oxygen in the ocean water. And that's how it adheres to rocks. And plants, plants are made of cellulose. And cellulose contains lignin. And lignin is this natural waterproofing, you know, resilient material that's also antimicrobial. And it's activated just by enzymes. Or the tree frog, he has little adhesive discs in the tips of his toes. And then the slug is my favorite because the slug actually emits a mucus and then it dries instantly. And that achieves the same sort of like adhesive, gluey substance. And here's the problem with what mo most people think of when they think of biomimicry. They're like, oh, well, the slug is doing exactly what the formaldehyde is doing. That's what you described, right? Glue. 
So if I get all those slugs together and build a slave farm of slugs, <laughs> and, I ex and I threaten them so that they exude this mucus, I will have a green product. That is not biomimicry. But I want to tell you about, so, so this is how it works, right? So you get these inspirations, these organisms that tell you exactly how to do it. And the students literally used it like blueprints. They understood the chemical structure, and they went out and they sought materials that would do the same function, but with, in a benign way. And one, of, and one of the examples that I like to point to is this really happy accident. It wasn't particularly good at preventing wrinkles, but it was really good at creating color, which is also a cross-linking function. And this is what happens sort of when you go through the invention process, right? And the numbers bear this out. So what Marty, the chemist I introduced you to before, found is that this process uses 1 20th to 1 80th the amount of water as a normal pigment and dye process. It uses a quarter of the carbon emissions. It's no, there's no residual dyes, there's no hazardous chemicals, and it dries faster. And this is all because we use nature to start off the process. Nature has been doing this for millions and millions of years, and we've been saying like, no thank you, I don't need those instructions, I'm gonna figure this out on my own. Why? Here's an example where it didn't go quite so well. The, um, there's a group in MIT that just created the most water repellent finish to date, it's supposedly 40% more effective than anything that's been created thus far. And they touted it in Nature Magazine as being inspired by the, by the butterfly. And because you can see in this image, there's microscopic ridges that form on a butterfly wing. And those actually broke the water apart into more, into tiny, tiny little parts, which created a, a more effective water repellent surface. The problem was that the material that they used to create it were these C8 perfluorinated chemicals, which are so nasty and so toxic that if an actual butterfly had been going in the lab at the time, it would have been dead in an instant. And so this is my second point about what is biomimicry and what is not. If your creation can kill <laughs> the emulated you know, organism that you're trying to model, that's not actually biomimicry. <laughs> But what is biomimicry is the forest. And the forest is a great example of cooperation. We used to think, or scientists used to think, not me, this is back in the 50s, the scientists used to think that that tree competed with that bush in order to attain nutrients and water. But in, term, in truth, it's actually just the opposite, that they share all of that material through the mycorrhizal layer. And that's because the goal of nature is a healthy forest. It's not just a single healthy tree. And what if we had companies doing the same thing? Could companies actually stop competing with each other but cooperate? What would that look like? And we're doing that exactly now with our design challenges. We're bringing together companies and academia to focus on one problem at a time. In this case, adhesives and color. And see if we can actually create a healthy industrial ecosystem. Not just one healthy company at a time. And as consumers, I want us to remember that we have choices too. We have that $21 trillion, right? If we start acting like we're on a team and we say to industry, we want safer, healthier products, do you think industry is gonna listen? That's $21 trillion at stake. I think they're gonna pay attention. So what can you do? I want you to, I want you to read labels. When you pay for something, pay attention. What's in it? What do I do with it when I'm done with it? When you're voting with your dollars, you're actually making an enormous difference. But the last thing that I really want you to do is I want you to go outside. There is an immense world out there and we just have to spend a few minutes a day, 20 minutes is all I ask, and go outside and quiet that clever mind of ours and notice things. And it doesn't have to be in a grand place like the forest or a lake. You can go right across the street and look at the branching pattern of that tree. And it follows a very specific mathematical sequence called the golden ratio or the Fibonacci sequence. And it's the same thing we see with shells and it's the same thing we see with our hands. It's an amazing secret code to the unlocking the universe. And so what if we use that to make our products and our buildings and our cities? Not only would it feel more natural, they would perform better. And so what I'm saying is don't just think outside the box. I want you to think outside. Thank you.